Hey there, it's time for VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk number 37. 37. Wait, there I'll add two there. there. Okay, there you go. All right. <laughs> Maybe we just just have a little countdown meter I get right, right here, you know. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll do it. <laughs> oh man, we got stuff to talk about tonight. That is stuff that you guys just need to know. You know, sometimes we get a little geeky here, but this looks like we have got basic voiceover tech stuff that we're going to cover tonight, right? Basic and advanced, and a little bit about which computer to get, and some new gear that I've seen pop up on the radar that maybe would be interesting to talk about. All that good stuff, right. and. What's and that noise. What is that noise? A little fun thing we had go on this week. Anyway, so all that and more, plus your questions, throw them in the chat room right now on Facebook, and we'll answer them here on VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk coming up right now. From the outer reaches, they came, bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Widom, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, making the complex simple, debunking the myths of what it takes to create great sounding audio, answering your questions, showing you the latest and greatest in VO tech, and having a dandy time doing it. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters, and VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Well, hello there. Welcome back to Voiceover Body Shop Tech Talk number thirty-seven. You know, I, I think we'll we'll never run out of stuff to talk about. I mean, I mean, you and I get together, we 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 never run out of stuff to talk about anyway. But, uh, but. Everybody wants to listen to us for some reason. And it's been that way for like 10 years. Hopefully we hopefully we've gained their trust. I would hope so. You know, because because we've been doing this voiceover home studio stuff for so long. You know, maybe we didn't know everything when we started. Did you know everything when you started working with Don LaFontaine and all that stuff? Oh, no, heck no, man. I was I was scared. I was pretty damn nervous that I was going to be found out. You know, the imposter syndrome problem. Yeah, really. But, you know, we've been doing this a long time, so we know home voiceover studios like nobody else because George and I have built more than anybody else combined. We've been pretty but, focused. Yeah, I mean, it's you learn, you know, week after week and time after time and client after client, what's everybody's different, every voice is different, every room is different. There are some basics that we, you know, we try to get across to people. But mm -hmm. still, it comes down to what's your situation, what's your voice, what, and how do we make you sound like you? So that's, if you really want to get it right up front, you got to work with the guys that know it better than anybody else. And I'll start and say, well, Mr. Widom certainly does. And, you know, I've been doing it long enough. I know I can do it. So why don't you work with us? And if you'd like some professional help and get the right information, the proper information for you and the right advice and not like do this, this, that, this, and the other thing, somebody who knows what it's supposed to sound like getting it there, work with one of us. For instance, if you would like to work with Mr. Whittem, all you have to do is go over to a very short domain, George, the dot tech. There it is right there. Yes. It ends in dot tech. That's it. Um, head over there and you'll be able to browse through and find 
uh, a large array of resources, free resources, such as what Sean Daly mentioned last week. I have added that to my free resources, free resources articles link. Um, there's a lot of stuff on there, but if you want to hire me, uh, starting with a sound check for 25 bucks, just get a completely objective listen to what you're recording down to designing a studio from the ground up and everything in between. That's where you head, George the dot tech. Dan also provides tech support I for do. hire on his website over at homevoiceoverstudio.com. Yes. And uh, I love to teach this stuff. I like to get people to understand the basics instead of reaching, well, what, what about this? What about that? There's a lot of mythology out there. There's a lot of silliness out there mm -hmm. and a lot of people who are experts at one studio their own and they don't know the stuff that you and i know about how it's supposed to what it's supposed to sound like you know there's a way it's supposed to sound and it's not like on the radio it's supposed you're supposed to sound like you how do you achieve that we know the way to do that and i love teaching that and yeah. if you've got a studio set up and you want me to give it a listen like george i've got my specimen collection cup over at homevoiceoverstudio.com just scroll down to the bottom of the page $25, I will do a very thorough analysis of your audio. If I think you need a lot of help, we can set up something else and we can do a consult. But a lot of times it's like, eh, you know, as Sean was saying last week, I hear your refrigerator behind you. <laughs> we, we get a lot of that. You'd be surprised what we hear that you don't hear because you're in the environment. So you hear that thing all the time. Right. And just, you just, your brain tunes it out. Yeah. But we'll hear it. Because yeah. we're going to hear what the mic hears, and the mic hears everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's there. It has it does not have a brain. No. No. Anyway. Here's it all. Yeah. Here's something I wanted to throw out to you, because, and, and to everybody who's listening, don't play engineer roulette with voiceover. You know, sometimes someone will email me and will say, well, I worked with so-and-so, and I wanted to get your opinion, and then they go to a third person you know, mm. And then you suddenly hear from them and, you know, mm. and then they don't realize it. we all know each other. We all talk. And it's like, did you get that question? You... Stick with somebody or yeah. st stick with the committee and go with the, because you're going to get the same information from the different, you know. I mean, people. we're going to agree on 80 to 90 percent. And if, right. but it's going to be that last 10 percent that you're going to get conflicting information on and you're going to start going crazy. Because you're going to try to figure out which is the right 10% of information. It's just, it's too much. Just follow someone that you know is trusted in the business. That's all. Take their advice, listen. And then as you get better at what you do, you can start absorbing other information and start being able to assimilate that. Because then you'll know enough to be able to better take advantage of new information. Right. So that's, that's called learning. It's learning. taking different things and assimilating them and you create synthesis. Mm hmm. That's learning. Synthesis? I have a master's degree in education, and that's like what they that. taught me. Synthesis is a good word for it. That's, I like it. That's because it's taking that and creativity is synthesis. Anyway, what's in your. That's synthesis. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> what's in your tech update this week? Lots of cool stuff, it looks like. Yeah. Um, well, I, and this is in no particular order. Just. I, Right before the show, I start thinking, looking, and just thinking what what I've dealt with and what's coming up on my plate for the last couple of weeks. So first thing, um, I started, well, my daughter is time. She is time for her to get a laptop. And uh, naturally, because I use Mac, I'm going to recommend Mac to her. She's 11. She doesn't need anything super advanced, but I didn't want to get her something on the low end. Like, I didn't want to get her a Chromebook. Um, you know, you can get away with a Chromebook for a lot of things. In fact, you can even run Twisted Wave because they have a web version. Ooh. But it's so limited in other, other ways. So, well, it's been a good couple of months. So I figured buy myself a new computer, <laughs> not her, me. So <laughs> I, I am ordering, I've ordered a new, a new Mac and a MacBook. The question for really came down to is which one? Um, I'm price sensitive. I'm not going to buy the loaded three thousand plus dollar MacBook Pro, just not. So I've classically only owned MacBook Airs. Um, they've always been fine for what I've needed, but this time instead of just getting the new 2020 MacBook Air, which by all accounts is a good computer, I did a little bit of searching and comparison shopping and reading and well, a lot of YouTube videos too. 
And I found out that for the money, when you compare feature for feature and overall performance and all the factors that I could think of that mattered to me, the best MacBook for the buck was actually a MacBook Pro, which surprised the heck out of me. I was able to find a 2019 MacBook Pro um, for a thousand bucks on eBay that's in perfect mm -hmm. condition. Um, and based on what I saw, because I do enough video editing on my laptop that it matters, the even that even the and this is the very very base model macbook pro 13 inch cheapest one they make um it still outperformed almost every i think even the highest end um macbook air and so when you compare those two computers and what you're getting like the, the loaded macbook air was a lot more expensive and so it just didn't make sense even though the macbook air was maybe just a hair lighter weight it wasn't that big of a difference. That the line between those two machines is very much blurred. And so this time I went for the MacBook Pro and it's coming this week and um, it supposedly has better thermals. Uh, in other words, it can cool itself better. Um, it's a quad core processor, which again, if you're doing a lot of video editing, you'll appreciate over just the dual core uh, MacBook Air. So anyway, the new MacBook Pro 13 inch, even the new new one, which I think is $1,300, may be better deal in the end for you depending on what you need to do so um consider that don't it's not such a super clear line anymore between those two machines so macbook pro you might want to consider it even though you don't necessarily need the bigger beefier machine it's a dang good deal All right. um okay so i'll let you know when i get it and of course i'll talk about my experience with it um so guess what? Al gets the MacBook Air, and it's a that my my 2014 MacBook Air is still a pretty dang good computer. I still edit lots of video on it. It still works great. It's still a good machine. Max Max just go are ever ready bunnies. They just keep going and going. Yeah, it even handled a nice tumble across a concrete uh, <laughs> cafe floor one time when it was under my arm, carrying it just you know, holding it in my hand but holding it on my side, and as I walked out, my sleeve caught the door handle. So I'm walking this way, <laughs> the, my sleeve stops here and the laptop just, it's physics kids. Yeah. Mr. Ding, 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 ding. Mean old Mr. Gravity. Yeah. And it just bent the heck out of the corners, but it still works great. All right. So this is the thing that came up in the last couple of weeks. I'm starting to realize people don't have equipment backups in their studio. And okay, maybe it didn't matter so much in the before times before COVID. Maybe you could just go to the studio if something was wrong, or you could go to your buddy's house and get that recording done. That's not happening right now, everybody. <laughs> you got to have backup gear. Um, and so I'm just saying, I'm, I'm not going to go on and on about this. Just have backups. Doesn't have to be, you know, necessarily a second 416, uh, unless you can afford it. But, you know, just have reliable but affordable you know, backup equipment. You got to be able to, at a moment's notice, swap out an interface, swap out a cable, although less, more rare to have a bad mic cable in the middle of your day, but still you should be able to swap out the interface, swap out a mic, whatever, and get back to work. Um, it's, it's crucial. And you're not going to get replacement gear right now quickly. It ain't happening. It's, and I'm now, I'm to the point now where, you know, when I'm shopping for equipment for a client, I'm buying what's available. And, you know, fortunately, a lot of what's available is still good, but it's not always my first or even second choice. But it's there so, for backup. I mean, you know, you, you, yeah. if, if you, there, you've got friends that might have some extra stuff. You can always borrow their stuff and have it for backup because it's yeah. probably not. But it's not, it's not four months ago where you could go Amazon right. Prime, next day delivery, new interface, boom. Not that easy, these kids need <laughs> to do that these days. So have some backups. All right. Um, now let's talk about audio processing in real time. So I've had requests to be able to set up processing so that people could be have their audio somewhat processed when they're doing live recording sessions. Live in this context, meaning via things like Source Connect and IPDTL, et cetera. And here's the thing about this. This is a sore subject. Um, I've discussed it and we've debated about it. I think the last uh, Pro Audio Suite we just did with Jeff Berlin it goes way into the weeds. I mean, it is geeky as heck because <laughs> Jeff is. He's an engineering genius, mad genius. But we talk about it a lot. But the bottom line is 
engineers do not like it when you process your audio, when it's going to an engineer and they're going to be working on the production. They hate it. But at the same time, some of you are getting away with less than optimal studios. You're in closets, you're in a blanket fort. It's not super quiet. Your refrigerator is on. Your kids are home. Uh, there's noises in the background and sometimes there's hums, like a hum where we set up an EQ whose job it is to notch out 60 Hertz and 120 Hertz so that that hum goes away. But that's all being done normally in post. So you may need to set up real-time processing. And that's not going to happen in some of the simpler softwares like Twisted Wave. Um, you may have to upgrade or get an additional program like Reaper to do this. Unfortunately, Reaper is very inexpensive, but it's also a little intimidating. So that's something you might want to consider. So if you're relying on processing to get away with a good sounding studio, because we're a lot of people are trying to get away with it right now, um, you might need to keep that in mind because when they hear your studio, they're going to evaluate it on the raw audio and that raw audio has to be devoid of those hums and that little bit of rumble and things that we were fixing later or fixing in post with EQ. So it's something to keep in mind, Dan. I mean, you're, you're lucky. You do have a pretty quiet space. Yep. It's tuned well, acoustically, the noise floor is low, but I mean, what are you telling your clients that are running into this problem? I mean, it must have well, come up. Well, with me, it's and, and you and I have discussed this so many times, it's always a matter of physical noise. And what you try to do with your studio is create a physical space that has minimal sonic invasion, you know, that of course. You know, sonic you know, sound transmission through walls. So isolate yeah. yourself as good as you can and make sure your acoustics are good. But if you've got... You know, I mean, if you're in a house, things are going to, or an apartment, which is where we see a lot of these problems. Usually it's from air conditioning Condos. compressors and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, if, you know, I was working with somebody who's on the fourth floor of a, of a, of a high rise condo and yep. they're right underneath the air conditioning compressor. I'm you like, always know, don't you? Yeah. Like I hear the sample and I'm like, are you in an apartment building? <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, and, and or, or they're, you know, they're on a middle floor and you hear water rushing by and stuff like that mm -hmm. from, from upper floors. Yeah. Um, you know, you, it's always a matter of trying to find the physical way to get rid of the noise. Uh, that's always first choice. It's using it, even a different microphone sometimes. That's right. Exactly. Um, yeah, 416 you know, is great for that. And yeah, uh, you know, which is why people use it. Uh, but the more sensitive the mic, the more it's going to pick up. That's why you don't go with a, you know, a $10,000 Geffel microphone. It's, you know, it doesn't make any sense in your closet unless your closet right. is in Fort Knox, you know. <laughs> right, uh, exactly. But I, to me, it's always do what is, you can physically. And sometimes that means not living where you live or finding some other place. Mm. But, you know, mm -hmm. you, trying to clean it up with technology, if you don't understand what it's supposed to sound like on the other side so that any processing you do is completely seamless. You really need, you need, really need our, our assistance with that. Yeah. And you can't use like um, a noise reduction tool, like an audacity. You can't use that real time. Right. You could, you cannot be done. If you get away with what you get away with by analyzing the room tone and then applying a noise filter tool using audacity or something like that, if that's how you get away with it and you get booked on a session that's live directed on Source Connect, yeah. it's not going to be pretty. That's right. So keep that in mind. Yeah. Re um, the Reflexion filter. Now, reflexion I used to have one of these. All of oh. those mud flaps and all those <laughs> things that go around behind your microphone, the semicircle, pointless. They're not pointless. for voiceover. They're not for voiceover. They're for music production. They're for isolate, partially isolating sound from one instrument to another. Maybe you might have a couple of horns in one room and you want the bleed to be controlled. Or you have a room that's pretty lively for music and now you want to re reduce some of the reverb. That's all these things do. They definitely do not make a instant voiceover studio. Not by a long shot. And every time I see one in a closet booth or any kind of a studio that's already been treated with clothing and everything else, the first thing I do is, can you just take that out of there? And almost every time it sounds better. Very rarely does it not. And they're almost always thrilled when I can tell them they can get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, Even really. if they just paid 200 bucks for it, they're still happy to take it out because now you don't have this freaking thing behind the mic that's 
creating it, making it harder to work the mic. Where do you put the copy? Yeah, yeah those things don't work. I, I, me on. I find that they, you know, and I, and I know Bo Weaver likes to talk about this. It sucks the energy out of your voice. And yeah, sometimes it sounds, well, a lot of times it sounds worse, I can tell you. Yeah, it, it, it really makes, you know, it's like, okay, so there's, you know, there's no reflection, but you know, there's sometimes you got to have a little bit of liveliness because I know Bo actually has a brick wall in one of his, his booths. Mm -hmm. You know, there's supposed to be a little, not slap back, but it, you don't want to sound like, you know, you're in a, you know, a totally, you know, a, a tube that is like totally sealed. Right. You know, yeah. So. Yeah. No. And, and they, they only work to slightly change the acoustical property. They won't make it super dead unless you're already starting with something that's pretty dead anyway. So right. it's not. You know, um, just a little funny thing. I think this is one of the worst product names I've seen in a while. KRK Rocket G, a Rocket 8 monitors and the new G4, I guess, fourth gen. Yeah. They have a white edition. They're calling them the white noise edition. I don't know what you think about microphone, <laughs> microphones or speakers. The last thing you want to be associated with your speakers is white noise <laughs> or any kind of noise for that matter. So, okay, okay, bad name choice, really bad. <laughs> um, more things, a couple little quickies. When you're buying interfaces, you'll probably see, if, especially on Amazon, you'll see the Scarlett 2i2, and then you'll see the Scarlett 2i2 bundled with a microphone, and it's only like $50 more or something. The, I mean, in most cases, those bundled microphones that are from the same brand as the interface almost always are not good. They tend to be noisy. They're not great quality mics. And it's kind of logical. I mean, you're buying a microphone branded by the same company makes the interface, which is a company that does not make microphones. Right. So all they're doing is buying some really cheap Chinese mic and just putting their branding and their name on it so that they can offer it to the complete newbie home, uh, not voiceover, home not, musician. Right. And, and I think that's the not issue. Not voiceover. Yeah, because it's for musicians. And if you, you, know, you have a mic that's kind of- Amateur. No yeah, if you've got a noisy mic, it means you, you, if you're playing a trumpet into it or you're using a heavy vocal, you can you can pot the, uh, the get interface down you and can, it, yeah, you're not going to hear it. Make it away with it, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's why they're doing it. But for yeah. voiceover, it's a lot more critical. Exactly. And last thing before we get into the more noise discussion, if you want to dabble with figure eight mics, because I've talked about them quite a bit, and, you know, they tend to be on the expensive side. Samson always surprises us with very affordable products that are hit and miss sometimes, I have to admit, but they just came out with a, a mic that's multi-pattern, USB. It's called the Samson Satellite Desktop USB slash iOS Broadcast Microphone, and it's a multi-pattern mic. So really? for 100 bucks, you have this little cute USB mic that has switchable patterns, and so now you can, you can dabble with figure eight. Um, for that price, I think it's around a hundred bucks. It's could be something fun to experiment with. Yeah. I'm not saying this is a great voiceover mic and I haven't tried it yet, but at that kind of a price point, it's kind of interesting to have a mic with switchable patterns. It gives you this different thing to experiment with. And you might find that it's worth trying out because I found that figure eight is helping a lot of people deal with less than ideal sounding small booths. Hmm. So it's just something that, that piqued my interest. I, I might snag one. Because it just, it's cool. Yeah. I like things that are $100 and less that are still useful. So we'll see if this one is falls into that category. Yeah. Well, something like that would probably be very good for, for podcasting. And It's for, definitely a podcasting product. Right. See, the, the, sure. the people that make this stuff realize that there are a lot more people doing podcasts than there are doing voiceover. And that's, oh, yeah, absolutely. And, that, and that's, and that's where the, the money in the development is going is into... Oh, okay. Now it's consumer level podcasting stuff because everybody can have a podcast. And as I like to say, not everybody should have a podcast, but at least you have the, the stuff to do it with. Exactly. So, so this week. Yes. <laughs> noise. There was, we, we, you got something from a client and we won't mention any names, but. No, it, someone who's a respected actor. Yeah. So working some, big time respect television jobs. Right. And. They sent you some audio, and, and what did they say? Well, I mean, there, there, was, a, there was a sound of like a, uh, according to her, there was like a high-pitched whistle or a buzz or some kind of artifact that was being heard on certain words. 
And, you know, of course, I, I listened to the audio. I was listening to all my usual good studio headphones that I always carry with me in my backpack. And I just, it just wasn't reading to me. I wasn't catching what she was referring to. And then she sent me another sample where she'd edited just the words she thought had that thing on it. And again, it was one of those things where it was, if it was there, it was so minuscule. It wasn't like reading to me. Like it wasn't like something where I'm thinking any engineer would take the audio and then go, ah, this is garbage. <laughs> I, it just wasn't there. So I shared it with a few trusted friends, basically the Wovo uh audio well, standards voices, committee yeah the audio standards committee exactly you know i i don't usually like to waste anybody's time with that kind of thing i rarely ever do that but just once in a while so i did i sent it to all y'all should i name names sure i sent it to uh cliff yep uh, uncle roy and uh jordan reynolds and yourself yep and everybody weighed in on the audio and everybody had a little bit slightly different thing to say. Somebody's maybe heard a little distortion. Somebody, of course, heard some sibilance. There was a little bit of sibilance. Just, just, um, but not just a little bit. But, you know, but the thing is when somebody, I didn't send the audio saying, can you hear this thing? I didn't want anybody to be like thrown off. I didn't want anybody like to have to like, I just wanted to say, listen to this audio, take it for its face value. What do you hear that could be different or better? And everybody had a little bit something different to say, which I thought was fascinating. Now, in the end, what I asked her to do was to send the file to the actual studio, the one that was going to be recording her the next day. And I said, let them hear it. Make sure they are happy. At the end of the day, like if you hear something, it doesn't mean you're wrong, but you don't hire you and you're not the one that's recording the session. And if the engineer in the studio is happy with what they're getting, count, you know, just count your blessings and do the job and collect the paycheck. Yeah. But it doesn't mean ignore it. It means there could be something going on that just isn't reading well. I mean, you know, that was, that was a challenging one. That's why I wanted to send it to more than one person because I just wasn't, I frankly just wasn't trusting myself at the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I gave it a listen and I'm like, well, I don't hear anything. I mean, you know, I know this person's voice, you know, I thought they were perhaps a little too close to the mic or more mm -hmm. than anything else. Uh, but it, you know, it sounded okay. The acoustics were good. Did it get it? Was it crunchy? Was it this, that, or the other thing? It sounded like that person's voice. And, yeah, I mean, and that's things all, are, I, all I look for. Yeah, I mean, you know, there was comments about levels. There was comments about proximity. All things that... You know, when you're in the middle of a Source Connect session, they're going to get a level from you, and the the, the engineer at the other end is going to say, hey, can you get a little bit closer? Can you get a little further away? Right. Can you, you know, you're popping the mic. Can you just angle, you know, they're going to, can you give us more level? We need a little bit more. No, we're clipping, turn it. The engineer is going to tell you all that stuff, you know. Um, as long as the audio is clean, even if it's a little sibilant, don't worry about it. The engineer is going to process it, EQ it. They're going to tune it in. Right. So, you know, it's, it's difficult because if once you hear something and it's in your ears and in your head, it's really hard to unhear it. And I understand the frustration of that. But, you know, if you send it to someone like me, I'm really going to listen to it through trusted source uh, playback devices. And if it's, if it's a problem, you're going to know. I'm going to let you know. My hearing isn't like maybe the hearing of a 20-year-old. But maybe better. It's still pretty good. It's still pretty good. I do have a check. Kids listen to today. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. If, I don't know if this falls into the sounds good. If it is good, if it sounds good, it is good. Because if it doesn't sound good to you, you might think it's not good. So this is sort of like the inverse of that. I don't know. But um, I don't even know what the point is of this. But just send it to the client. Send it to the studio. Send it to the engineer. Let them be the ones to say this is going to work for us, you know, because everybody is going to have an opinion. And when you send it to five engineers, like I did, all listening in these incredibly well-tuned studios with great monitors, they're listening to it under a magnifying glass and they're going to pick out the littlest thing. Yeah. So and the I was thing careful not to tell her everything everybody was hearing. I didn't want her to have a complex. No, no. I, it's I, like I, audio really is fine. Yeah. I mean, the, the bottom line was, is like, well, this is totally acceptable audio. And, you know, I, 
I know you talk to somebody like Cliff, and he's like, oh, I can work with that. I can just use this and use that. And it's like, I can work with that, but I hear this and this and this. Right, exactly. But <laughs> I but hear all these problems. Right. The thing is, is if you're getting hired, if you book the gig on the audition from the audio you had, right. forget about it, you know, unless you're doing something different. And, yeah. you know, things generally, if you're, if it's the same settings, the same microphone, the same booth, nothing's going to change. You know, right. and, you know, unless you change headphones or something like that. But, you know, my immediate thoughts on that are always like, well, what are they listening to it on? You know? Oh, yeah. I mean, we covered all that. You know, I said, try different headphones, play it back in a different place. Right. So that's it made it made it challenging, yeah. you know, because when you hear that thing that bugs you, you can't unhear it. Yeah. I, I had a buzz in here the other day. And I'm like, where the hell is it coming from? You know, I'd go in the booth. I couldn't hear it in the booth and come back out in the studio. I'm here. What is it? You know, was it the subwoofer? No, it wasn't the subwoofer. And I still haven't found it. I think, oh. I, I think, I think it's just the, and then it went away. And I'm like, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> all right. You know, it's, you know, maybe my brain is just starting to really deteriorate like the rest of my body. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm like, you know how I am with sound. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, wait, is it in here? Is it I'm going to sniff it out? <laughs> I'm going to figure out what it is. That's right. But uh, it doesn't matter because I go in the booth and it wasn't in there. You know, just helicopters. It's not in the recording, right. yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we got lots of great questions. We do have lots of questions. And then, I just uh, saw five more pop up. All right. So let's get to them right after these messages on VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. Hi, this, Hi, this is, is Bill Farmer, Farmer and, and you are watching VoiceOver Body Shop. It's great. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. It's Source Elements time. Yes, Yay. that's right. Source Elements, one of our wonderful sponsors. Source Connect is their flagship product that voice actors primarily need these days to stay connected to their clients' studios all around the world or right down the street. Because even if you're in L.A., chances are you're going to be recording with a studio in L.A. or a producer who's working from his home in L.A. and connecting to them with something like Source Connect or Source Connect. I mean, Source Connect is really the, it's kind of a standalone tool that doesn't really completely have a replacement right now. There are many softwares that run or solutions that will allow you to do the same on Chrome or on a web browser. But this is a dedicated app that is fine-tuned for pro professional audio recording. The audio quality is consistent from beginning to end, never wavers, never warbles. Only thing that may ever happen 
is there might be a dropout when there's just too much loss of data, the signal might drop and then come back. That's the internet, it's gonna happen. But I'm telling you, the audio quality never changes throughout the session, never fades in or fades out, and it also never loses sync. It stays sample rate lock synced the entire time. So if you're doing anything that's gonna be to picture, let's say you're doing ADR, you have to do looping, or you have to do, uh, uh, at, not anime, is that the word? You're basically dubbing a voice over another voice, matching lip flaps, any of that stuff, music, sync has to be perfect the whole time, and Source Connect can, can do that. Anyway, you should probably have it ready to go in your studio. Go to Source Elements, get a 15-day free trial, or just get, just don't mess around, just get the subscription. Just get it going. Um, learn how to set it up, get it up and running, so you're confident that it's working 100% before that big session, that big opportunity comes your way. It's totally, totally worth it. It's a write-off. And it's really, again, on a monthly subscription, it's quite reasonable. Source Elements, thanks for your support. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll be right back to answer a ton of questions. This is Anthony Mendez. You're, you're watching Voice Over Body Shop. Hey. Hey. Oh, hey. And we're back. Here on Voice Over Body Shop Tech Talk, boy, people have lots of questions for us. And that's what we love. We love answering questions. First uh, one's a long question with a short answer. With, with a guy with a really interesting name. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you get to read that. Okay. Moose Where Warwoda. Where, what, yeah. Moose, we know who you are. Uh, this is Wary Woda. Wh wh I like Wary Woda. Wary Woda. I think you're probably right. Anyway. He says, I'm on my second Focusrite Scarlet Octopre. Bottom mm -hmm. line, my UA Apollo has two XLR inputs and the Townsend Lab Sphere takes up both of them. So I need another mic input for my 416. Okay, jumping ahead. The Focusrite Scarlet Octopre is crap, as is the second one is starting to do the same thing as the first. <laughs> static in the channel. So mm -hmm. I posted on, on, on GS. Gear sluts. Gear sluts, thank you. About sluts. other light pipe enabled mic pre's. Mm -hmm. uh, a fellow gear slutter said they mm -hmm. heard good things about the Arturia Audio Fuse 8 pre. Mm -hmm. Now I read on Sound on Sound review of it and was pretty interesting, mostly the gain and levels on the unit. From the review, yes, we're getting into it here. To put it another way, an input signal that just reaches 0 dBFS with the 8 pre at full gain will peak around minus 12 dBFS on the Quantum and minus 23 dBFS on the Claret, which is the Focusrite one. Uh, it right. sounds like a unit that makes no sense for a VO person. Duh. Anyway, looking at their interfaces... There's some interesting stuff there like dis, dis, discrete prees, Bluetooth connectivity, and more, and a competitive price point. I wanted to know if either of you dudes had any experience with Arturia. Whoa, that's a big helicopter. Is that coming? I hope that means there's not a fire. <laughs> that's, no, that's here. No. That is here, my friend. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's just my air conditioning. <laughs> no, that's not. You just had a big chopper flying yeah, over. Look, look for uh, and I have my window, I have my door open. Yeah. So Yeah, now I, I look at something like this. This is a rack-mounted eight-channel interface. Why would you need something like that for voiceover? Well, I mean, okay, so he's using an L22 microphone, which right. says a lot. That means right. that you're, you're definitely not afraid to spend some money and you like some pretty geeky gear. Right. It's also redundant to have a 416 because you have... The Townsend Lab Sphere L22, which yeah. sounds has a 416 <laughs> model. So, okay, that aside, the Arturia stuff, I've seen it at trade shows, at NAM and stuff, and they, they're really interesting because they seem to pack as many functions to, per square inch as humanly possible into their device. They have like a small desktop one that's square-ish, which has more controls and more functions than anybody has any has anybody right has any right to have <laughs> and and so i look at it and go that is awesome and also it could be a, a massive train wreck and i just had there hasn't been enough of them being used in our field and voiceover to have any for me to formulate an opinion any opinion long term like is it going to work day after day how well is it made how's the drivers 
Because at the end of the day, it's, it's sound quality. We what we done the, we did the USB interface shootout, so we know that sound quality of mic preamps and all these is almost the same. Right. So it just comes down to quality of and long term reliability, and that is something that's definitely not been proven with the Arturia stuff yet. It's just not very new or not very old. It's not been around that long. So right. yeah, I don't know. It's it's. I mean, that's high end stuff. I mean, that stuff is designed for musicians. And yep. Yep. I, I, you know, if, if you've got a bunch of different mics, just get a good mixer, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, you that's, could, you're only recording one thing at a time. Right. Exactly. You, know, you could just turn one on, turn one off yeah, or plug one in and unplug the other one. Multiple pre's, multiple yeah. channels of AD yeah. converters, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. That's a geeky question that makes a lot of people's eyes roll to the back of their hand. Oh, yes. I'm always in. Yeah. It's so, always nice to open up with one of those. Yeah. But you got Thanks, a, Mom. yeah, you, you got a letter from somebody this week. Um, yeah, he's, this is from Michael Kearns. He says, uh, I hope all's well with you and yours. I loved your review of the L22. Speaking of that, Mike. And the latest one on the Vanguard V4. Which was that? Um, it's a great mic. Um, I never have paid that much attention to the kinds of plugins that I use, such as VST, VST3, VST3i, AU, AUI, etc. <laughs> I use Reaper on Mac. Um, is there any particular type of plugin I need to use? They all seem to work. So doing I, what? It's almost like he answered. <laughs> asked, he, it's, not, it's like he literally answered the question. They all work. Um, so what are you worried about? Um, well, I mean, the native plugin format for Wint for a Mac system is AU. That's audio units. So that's going to be the one I'm always going to pick first. If they give me multiple versions that I can actually uncheck, not install the others, I'll usually just install AU. Um, so that's my first choice. But it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The thing is, like, some plugins, they install all of the versions, uh, like RX. I think when you install RX, it's going to install AU, VST, AAX. That's what Pro Tools uses. It's going to install all of them. So um, whatever ends up showing up in your DAW and working, you're good. I don't overthink it too much. You know, it, but AU is the native Mac format, so that's what I usually will use. Right. You know, and 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 of course, the the operative question is why would you use that plugin? You know, having the plugin doesn't that's make your audio. A rat hole. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Doesn't make your audio better because you bought it or you have it. It's knowing yeah. how to use it, and that really does take years of experience and understanding of what it's supposed to sound like and how you're bending the noise. So, if you're like yeah. a real geek about plugins and stuff like that play with them but don't make them interfere with your voiceover career yeah. yeah i get people that send me an audio sample to make them a processing stack for auditions and they say well i have the ozone and i have uh, waves this and the l2 and the blah 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 and then i send them back something that has three or four probably built-in plugins that came with twisted wave or audition you know i didn't use any weird third-party stuff and they're like well it sounds great it's just because i know how to use the tools Got to know, what you're, know how to use those tools. Absolutely. Um, Jeff, our very own Jeff Holman. Which is the reason. Questions. Yeah, which, this is the reason he likes doing this for us, because he gets to ask all the questions. That's right. And he didn't, <laughs> he didn't get his ass last week, so he gets two. <laughs> you get it, Jeff. You got it, Jeff. Um, he says, can I use the Sennheiser 41.6? That's the way I like to say that now. Or any XLR connected mic as an external mic for recording video on an iPhone 6S plus through its 3.5 millimeter headphone jack or on the current iPhone model. So yes and no. I mean, yes, you definitely can, but no, not without um, several power. different components. Yeah. yeah, you need phantom power. Um, that really is the main thing. You need phantom power. So you have to, the mic has to be powered. And then with the right cables and adapters, you could go from XLR to an eighth inch mini then to a splitter that will adapt that from a headphone jack to a trrs adapter isn't that what the irig oh. used to do yeah actually the ik irig the also the um the tascam ixz i think it was called right just a right. little white simple little box that plugs into a phone headphone jack that did that actually for like 40 or 50 bucks so yeah the irig the tascam 
are they that clean? Is the sound quality going to be that great? Eh. No. <laughs> if you're using a headphone jack on a 6S or iPhone, it's the, the AD converters, the preamps are g- decent. But, you know, whatever clean or low noise that mic has, you're going to lose it. It's going to be noisy. Yeah. So you, then you also about, asked about the current iPhone model. Now, that's a whole different story because now you don't have a, a headphone jack anymore. Right. You have either one of these little doodads, which just happened to be right in front of me, with one that goes from lightning to eighth inch. This little thing looks like a simple adapter, right? That's it's all that looks like it's just nothing but a, an adapter, right? Yeah. But what's actually going on here, this is a sound card. This is a USB audio interface. Really? It's inside here. So this thing has to take digital from the phone. Right. Convert it to analog, send it out here so you can hear it. And these, this is a, a headset jack. So it takes the microphone, sends it back in, preamplifies it, digitizes, and sends it back into the phone. All in this little $30 cable. Wow. That's what's going on inside. This is an interface. People have no idea. So, yes, you could use one of these, but I would get a proper audio interface that's designed to use to be work work with an iPhone like the um the Centrance Micport Pro or the uh, Thank you. The, the Micport Pro 2, yeah. absolutely. Like if you're using a $1000 Sennheiser 416, use, use a really good preamp. Yeah. Use a digital interface that will go digital lightning port into the iPhone. That way you're going to maintain all of the sound quality of the source. So, very important. Yeah. Um also Oh, sorry. Did you have something you want to? No, 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 no. You 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 hit it right on the head there. Okay. And and he says how as, how far can I be from a boom mic like a four sixteen and still have it pick up my voice properly? Uh, that actually is a good question. So I mean, I I feel that de- very much depends on the environment. Right. So if you are outside in a field, <laughs> not that you're going to be, but your that sentence or four sixteen could be ten feet away. It could be quite a bit out. It could be way far away, way over your head. Or as long as the background noise is quiet, there's no acoustics. I mean, outside, there's no acoustics. Because that's what that mic was actually designed for. Right. And so it's not going to hear much else except you. And it can be pretty far away once you add enough gain. Where that falls apart now is once you're going inside and once you're going into a small space. Right. When you're in a really small space a whisper room, or any kind of small booth, that goes out the window. You have to be up pretty damn close to the mic. I mean, six inches is about as far as you can get away with before it starts to sound mm, boxy or tubey or something. Yeah, well, of course, the farther away you are from the mic, the, the louder you have to talk, and the louder you talk, the more the acoustics of the room come into play. Okay, well, I'm, I'm on a shotgun mic. It's not a 416, but it's a Rode NTG4. Mm-hmm. It's a decent stand-in for 416. And let's see. Let's see how far I can get back. So, obviously, I just cranked my gain up all the way. I am about a foot and a half away. You're starting to hear the room reflection now, right? Right. A little bit, right? It's not bad. It's not bad, but it's there. Now, the thing about this room is it's got a huge amount of space on my on the right side and behind the mic. Right. And a big rack of clothing, because now my studio just doubles as my closet. <laughs> Sounds weird, but it's true. So I can get away with that, right? Um, but yeah, it's still, I'm still hearing some of those reflections. I can't really get much more than about this far away before it starts to sound a little less focused. So yeah, you can't get too far away, not inside a, not inside a home or inside a booth. Right. I think I uh, overdid that one. All right, moving on. <laughs> this is for you, Dan. I oh, think. Okay. Yeah, Rich Brennan says, uh, the mic bump, Dan Leonard. That's me, by the way. Um, the mic above your head, is that the one you're using? Yeah, I think so. Uh, so far away, but sounds so close. What mic is that? Ah, this is such a great follow-up question after what we just talked about. This is a Harlan Hogan VO1A. And, I mean, you got to remember that George and I work very hard to make the audio on this show outstanding uh one because we do it as a podcast but also because the show's about audio uh and yeah harlan's one of our sponsors and yeah he sent us this mic and yeah i like this mic because like any good standard studio condenser mic it's going to pick you up 
from the if you're if you're facing it right or if you're using it right, it's going to pick you up no matter what. And I mean, unless I really turn far away, it's still going to sound good. But George is also sitting there riding levels over there in, in Topanga Canyon and uh, making sure that I that I sound good. But this mic, Actually, I'm not. I don't touch a damn thing because I have a lot of processing on that microphone. Oh, okay, <laughs> and that's why it sounds so good. But it's still well, it, it's not the processing. I mean, the processing is helping. Yeah, it's the room, kids. Oh yeah, you, you you have no idea how much stuff is acoustically treating that room. Dan's studio has a vaulted ceiling. Yep, there's not a flat ceiling above, and then it's covered in acoustical clouds, huge acoustic panels that break up reflection that would normally be bouncing off that ceiling. And it's because of all that work he's done to the room and then behind him, that green screen behind it is a massive sound absorption panel. One of your old studio suits, right? It's, it was the largest piece of studio suit. I've actually cut it right. down. It was too big before, but we actually, there's a huge amount of tuning in that room acoustically to, right. to so that is why he can get away with such a, a decent, a distant placement. Right. Whether it's a condenser cardioid or even a shotgun mic, the room acoustics do, do still matter. Yeah. Um, and that's why we can get away with it. Right. But yeah, there's some processing. I'm using compression. That way Dan can get a little further, a little bit back. Right. And it still sounds relatively even in the levels. Right. But I can yell in here and it just it just disappears. Barely hear the room. Yeah, it just yeah. dies away. Yeah. I'm, so. I'm, I'm very proud of this room. It works really yeah. well. I think putting the big couch overnight. in hell too. And yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, we did a lot of work to tune that yeah. room. Yes. Nathan Carlson asks. Nathan. Yes. Hey, man. Go for it. Uh, as long as the gear and recording space all stay the same, how often do you recommend refreshing your processing stacks? Um, do adult voices change enough that it's worth it periodically? Um, it was certainly helpful for my kids. Um, any guidelines you can share? Yeah, I... Yeah, so the processing that you might be doing on your voice, a little bit of EQ, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, yeah, the, the voice quality, does it change over time? I mean, well, okay, kids, we know their voices change. They deepen, you know, there are changes there. I don't know, this is a better question for you, Dan. I mean, you've been a voice actor for a long time. Mm -hmm. Have you felt like you've changed the way you do anything to your voice? Technically, either microphone choices or EQ or anything. I mean, I've I've been I've stayed very consistent with the microphones I've been using over the past few years. You know, I've got a four sixteen, I've got my my custom forty seven uh, that you know that I built from our friends at mikeparts dot com, um, and you know, and then you know we've got the Harlan Hogan V O one A, which we've had as a standard mic here on the set at Voiceover Body Shop since we started here, pretty much, and. You know, I trust these mics, but I'm of the opinion that it's not the microphone and it's never the microphone. If you've got good microphones, you trust that equipment. It's not the microphone. It's how you use it. And if my voice is changing somewhat, I I can, you know, will I change the processing? Not really, because then I'm not being honest with myself and to my clients, because what they want is the sound of my voice as I exist, not as something else. Because if my voice is changing, then perhaps the genre of material will change. You know, as I go yeah. from middle-aged guy to grandpa, you know, but the mic's still going to pick me up the same way. It's not really, I to me, it's not relevant. And I think people obsess and overthink this stuff. They go, well, my voice has changed. Now I need to change the... No, the mic's still picking you up the same way. It's just your voice has changed. You're not going to change it back with technology to something else than it was before. So forget about it. What do you think? Yeah. I think I just talked myself out of a sale, but that's okay. I, I'm sorry. Because <laughs> I'm being on. No, I'm being honest here. I mean, if it ain't, it, it, you know, it, I don't think you're going to have to do any changes to your processing, Nathan. The only thing that might change would be me, like as the engineer. I might listen to it a second time, two, three years ago, later, and go, well, now I think I would probably take a little, maybe uh, 2 dB away at 600 hertz or something like that, you know, because maybe my tastes or my skill or my ears have changed. 
but you, no, that's not likely that your voice has changed enough that would re garner, require any change of your processing. So yeah, you're, don't worry about you it. You are you, and that's what you're selling. And, and, yeah. and your voice as unique as it is. So don't, don't fuss with it too much. You know, I mean, there are certain, I mean, you, you've got your, your, uh, your stacks that you, you work with people, but those are for minor little corrections in a room. Yeah, really for auditions. Yeah. You know, and 90% of the time just to make it a little bit louder. But when you're working with somebody else and you're sending them files, they're the end user and they're the ones mm -hmm. that make the final determination. Uh, Jem, yep. Jem Torres asks a question, please. Oh, well, you've come to the right place. I have an MXL 990 and a Scarlett 2i2. I ordered a mono price XLR cable and they sent me a pig hog tour grade mic cable. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how much do oh, I need man. to worry about pig cables hog. and yeah, cable? <laughs> how much do That'd I need? That'd be like calling the cable horse pony brand. <laughs> Anyway, do I need to worry much about the brands of cables? Also, any recommendations for a USB screen as a second screen option for a MacBook? Thanks much, gentlemen. My cables, okay. you don't buy crap cables. I mean, I've done it. But... Okay, so, I mean, <laughs> Monoprice is surprisingly good for what it is. It's, they're, they're really bang, good bang for the buck cables. Pig hog. <laughs> Here's, I'm... I don't know that brand at all. It's I used to have a brand of cables. I think they were called Roadhog. So I guess that's where that, that ripoff name came from. I mean, as long as the connectors are good, the solder joints are good, and when you plugged it in, this, the mic is clean, there's no buzz, you're fine. I mean, um, the, the Tor grade mic cables usually have very thick, heavy insulation. They have a very, they feel really beefy in your hand because they're designed to be rolled over by trucks and carts and trampled on and all that kind of stuff. In your studio, they're plugged in and left in one place year after year after year. So you don't want a crappy cable of bad connections, but as long as you plug it in and it sounds fine and there's no noise, you're all right. Why they switch brands on you, that sounds like an Amazon <laughs> yeah. trick. Yeah, really. That sounds like to me. Yeah. But you're not, you're yeah. not going to suffer from those. Those are probably great cables. You'll probably be all yeah. right. And to wrap, I'm not a big cable snob. Yeah. And to wrap things up here, Thomas Machin says, uh, and which essentially covers everything we've just been talking about, says, other than the prestige of expensive industry standard, of which there is no such thing, gear and software, isn't it all about the end product? Why is there so much gear snobbery? Because... Like we always say, we end, we end every show saying the same thing. If it sounds good, it is good. <laughs> um, exactly. Gear snobbery it comes. There's gear snobbery like there's mountain bike snobbery because I'm a big time mountain biker, and I have bikes that range from probably worth two hundred dollars to four thousand dollars. They're all freaking fun to ride. <laughs> They're all awesome, and gear is the same way. There is cheap gear that works well, and there's really expensive gear that works well. There's really expensive gear that doesn't work that well, or is a pain in the neck to deal with. In terms of maintenance so it's just it's just the way people are man they get egos they they invest a ton of money in their equipment and they get mad when somebody comes along with gear that costs one tenth what they spent and they're making more money in voiceover than they are you know people have fragile egos and they want to you know yeah it's i think it's all about measure ego. things right exactly <laughs> exactly but the thing is is it's not the equipment. You don't buy crappy equipment. You don't buy really expensive stuff. You use the stuff that you can afford and you learn how to use it properly. And that's what makes you sound like you. And of mm. course, when we listen to it and go, yeah, that sounds like you. And that's the bottom line. And that's where we're going to finish there you go. this tech talk. Anyway. Oh, and by the way. Yeah, there's what? There's something else here. What did I ever miss? Because I could literally reach it without leaving the room. <laughs> Here is a USB monitor. Oh, not very big. Oh, actually, wait a minute. Is this one USB? Oh, wait, it's not USB. Never mind. Never mind. Oh, I pulled this one out because it's a touchscreen. Ah. It's HDMI, but it's a touchscreen monitor. You can actually touchscreen your your Mac with it. Fascinating. Um, I've dabbled with USB monitors, Gem, and um, um, most of them have been kind of gimmicky and 
not perfect, yeah. but there are a couple. Get stick to big brand names like Asus. Um, but my favorite thing is the iPad with the Luna Display adapter. Ah, got LunaDisplay.com. Type it in. Go look at it. Read about it. That's my favorite second screen for a Mac solution. So anyway, all right, all right. I well, miss that one. I, that, I'm glad you meant, you brought that up. All right, we got a couple more messages here, and we'll be right back to wrap things up for another week of Tech Talk. You're watching, watching VOBS TV. TV. I don't know why. It's crazy what they do here. I think I'm going to go somewhere else and have a cheese sandwich. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big-voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? Stick around. You don't want to miss this. Look what you made me do. Power 103.9. At Target, we want you to come as you are. Be comfortable. Uh, okay, maybe not bathrobe comfortable. Pants for the customer in aisle four, please. Nuevo México necesita un cambio. La representante Michelle Lujan Grisham ha luchado por nuestro estado en la Cámara de Representantes. Watch anywhere, anytime on an unlimited number of devices. Sign in with your Netflix account to watch instantly at Netflix.com. The ice cream maker is a big risk that can have huge reward until you forget to turn it on. Well, that's it, guys. Time is up. Hey, it's JMC. Thanks for watching the voiceover body shop. If you're demo ready or looking to get there, check out jmcdemos.com and see a sample of our work. Now let's get back to Dan and George and this week's tech wisdom. What question do we get most often? Far and away, it's how do I even get started in voiceover? And we have a great answer to that question. Take the voheroes.com free getting started in VO course. You heard right. It's free, and it's available online 24-7 at gettingstartedinvo.com. That's gettingstartedinvo.com. If you've been watching VOBS and thinking that you need to get in gear and start your own voiceover career, this is the course you should start with. You'll learn about the vocal skills you need, the storytelling skills you need, the equipment you need, the business skills you need, and the mindset you need to have all in one single comprehensive online course taught by VO Heroes David H. Lawrence the 17th. This course won the Backstage Reader's Choice Award four years in a row. And again, there's no charge. It's absolutely free. Want to take it? Of course you do. Getting started in VO.com. That's getting started in VO.com. So our good friend Harlan Hogan is on vacation in Maine. Isn't it gorgeous? Anyway, he wanted me to tell you that he hasn't missed doing any work while he's on vacation, hanging out on somebody's yacht, because he's got his Porta Booth with him. This is a great unit. It makes it easy for you to travel on the road, and it's easy to take apart and put together. All you have to do is zip it up or unzip it in this particular case, and it all just folds up into a nice, neat carrying case. The Porta Booth Plus, plus the Porta Booth Pro, which you see right here. The Porta Booth Pro, the bigger model, is $369.99. The Plus, $199.99. And the bag is on sale for $49.95, but you can get it in a combo for $248.95. Go over to voiceoveressentials.com right now and get your Porta Booth Plus or Pro. This is Ariana Ratner, and you're listening to VoiceOver Body Shop, VOBS.TV. Well, that was fun. I mean, it's it always, always is. It's fun talking with you, George. And but this is our stuff, and it's just fun to go over all of these things and tell people don't overthink this stuff. It's not. It's not rocket science. It's not a black art. It's just voiceover. Well, maybe a little bit. Well, I, yeah. I mean, there's certain <laughs> things. There's some things we know, but you know it. It's not that hard. Yeah, but don't but, get too don't get too sucked into the tech vortex, yeah. tech upgrade vortex. Yeah, the questionable <laughs> purchase of the week. That's a great one. Uh, anyway, uh, who are our donors this week? Because without you guys, we wouldn't do this. Yeah, we got some very familiar names this week, as we do almost every week, thanks to the subscribers. 
such as Uncle Roy of Antland Productions, Graham Spicer, Christy Burns, Michael Kearns, Mike Gordon, Harlow Rodriguez, Martha Kahn, Lee Penny, Lee. and Don Griffith. Lee doesn't even work in voiceover anymore. He still donates to the show. Right. <laughs> but he watches the show. Yeah. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, we see him all the time here. Uh, we also need to thank our amazing sponsors like Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. Uh, VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. VOHeroes.com. VoiceActorWebsites.com. And JMC Demos. All right. Thanks to Jeff Holman doing a great job in the chat room tonight. All yeah. those questions are right there. Sue Merlino for just getting it done from her <laughs> oh, man, garage geez. in Burbank. Tenacious. She gets it done. She is. And Lee Penny for just being Lee Penny and for being a donor, but that's another thing. Um, that's going to do it for us this week. Thanks for tuning in and or clicking in or whatever you call it when you're on the internet. We're, you know, we're old. What can we say? The thing is, we're here to help. We want to make sure your audio is right, because if all of your audio is good, it makes everybody else look good because a rising tide floats all boats. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But mm. the bottom line is, if it sounds good. It is good. All right. That's going to do it for us. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. We'll see you next week with another great guest. Take care, guys.